Today we'll talk about some of the governing equations in fluid dynamics. Uh, I know you've seen many of these things before, but uh, take a maybe a look at perhaps a different way, or at least a good review. Um, I'll often use the phrase balance laws rather than conservation laws, uh, just because it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? For example, momentum isn't really conserved when we have a force, right? It's a uh, Momentum is not conserved. That's producing, you know, momentum as we exert a force. Um, so I like to use this word. And um, before we get into it, I just want to review one thing: uh, this total derivative. Sometimes in fluid mechanics, we call it the substantial derivative or material derivative. Uh, really, really need that mathematically. It's just a total derivative, right? To distinguish it from a partial derivative. So, for example, if I'm measuring the density. Uh, it's a function of my position, x, y, z, but also of time. And if I wanted to take a derivative, uh, for example, derivative with respect to time, I need to take a total derivative. And so if we just use the chain rule and recall that um, the position of this particle, you know, x, y, and z is also a function of time. So we need to consider the chain rule. So I have the partial derivative with rho respect to time, right? If the partial derivative means everything else is constant. So at a fixed position, how do things change in time? But I also need to consider my variation with x, noting that x is also a function of time, right? This it could be moving through a fluid or this particle may be moving um, and, and so on, right? If I consider the other components, dy dt, this is just, just the chain rule. And so we often, uh, so we can express it this way, this latter part, right? This is just, uh, this is for example, my x component of velocity, y component, and the z component. Those are just the components of velocity. So we could write this as, uh, the gradient of rho, that's these three elements here, dotted into the velocity vector, right? So just dotted into the velocity vector, okay? And that's the total derivative. Some texts will use a big D, right? So we'll say D rho dt. I don't use that notation just because, you know, Mathematically, we already do it this way, right? This is just a total derivative, just to distinguish it from a partial derivative. Um, so uh, one way to maybe motivate these two different terms, how you might think of what they mean, I think it's easier to think of something like temperature as opposed to density. But imagine I'm in a room. Let me just draw a room here. Here's a room, and let's say that half of the room was warmer than the other side. And you know, there's probably some gradient, but just to keep it simple, let's say it's pretty warm over here. It's pretty cold over here. Uh, and But let's say it's completely stagnant. Nothing's changing. Of course, that's not going to happen because of the gradient, but let's just freeze it. Right? If I stay at some fixed point and don't move, this term here is zero. That's what this partial derivative means, right? It's a fixed position. What's the change in my density at time in this location? It's unchanging. Whereas this term, this is my convective term. It's got this velocity term. So if I'm moving through this field, or the other way, if I've got a fluid, right, I'm tracking particles that are moving, how is the, because of the gradient, and let's say temperature in this case, uh, how is my change in temperature affected by the fact that there's a gradient and I'm moving through that gradient? So as I move from this portion to this portion, the temperature that I feel changes, not because anything in the room changed, but because of the motion, because of the velocity and the existence of a gradient, temperature gradient. Now, conversely, or, or in addition, let's say I heated the whole room up, right? So that if I was at a given point, this term is now non-zero because that's warming up, right? And if I'm moving, then the total change in temperature that I experience is the sum of the temperature change from the gradient, the motion, plus the temperature change 
from everything heating up. So I need to consider both parts, right? The uh, at a fixed position, how things are changing in time and how things are changing with the movement, the convective term. All right, and that put together, that just gives us the total derivative. So that's just by way of review. Let's go back to considering our balance laws. Uh, a professor of mine gave this analogy that I like uh, back in grad school about a bank account. Um, and you could think of a fluid, a control volume as the same way, right? So if I was to give the bank account analogy, we could say that the accumulation, the amount that I accumulate in my bank account is a sum of what comes in the inflow, and that would be deposits in our bank account, right? Minus the outflow, that's the withdrawals, right? Plus any production that occurs within that bank account, and then that would be interest in this financial analogy, okay? So the same applies for a fluid. Uh, within my control volume, the accumulation of some quantity, say density or pressure or whatever, is equal to the density that flows in across that control surface into my control volume, minus anything that comes out, plus anything that is produced within the control volume. Okay, so, but typically in the, in the balance laws, we, we take the same equation, but we rearrange it. We would say the accumulation uh, plus, and I'm going to take this term and move it over and this term and move it over, but we'll just call it a net outflow, right? So that means outflow minus inflow is equal to production. This is just the way we'll normally see it in the, in the fluid balance. Okay, so let's first um, apply this to uh, mass, uh, but just by way, way of review, when I talk about a control volume and notation, so control volume, this just refers to this entire volume, and then we'll use the symbol S to represent the exterior, the surface that encapsulates this control volume. Okay, so let's look at mass, and let's apply the concept that we had, right? First is uh, the accumulation of the mass plus the out net outflow equals the production. So the accumulation, uh, the total mass that I have in my control volume is just the integral of rho times dV integrated over the volume, right? So if density was constant, it would just be density times volume, but because density is varying everywhere, I need to do an integral. So I take density, instantaneous density times my tiny control volume or my tiny infinitesimal volume integrate over the whole volume and the accumulation then that's just my mass right is how is this mass changing in time okay so that's the accumulation term now i need to consider the net outflow how much mass is coming in and out and it comes in and out because there's a velocity right so i got some control volume and the fluid is moving through this control volume some is coming in, some is coming out. So this is also going to be an integral, and I'm going to integral over the boundary, right? This is about the outside. I'm just looking at what's coming in and out, so I can do that by integrating just over this exterior surface. So it's going to be an integral over the surface. Um, from a basic fluids class, you saw that your mass flow rate, which this is what this is, was rho v a, right? That's how fast mass is moving across something. So uh, we're going to do a similar type of thing. It's rho v a, except for my a is just going to be this differential area, and I integrate across the entire area, right? Because again, it's varying at each point. The other difference is rho v a was kind of this one-dimensional analog, right? Where we said, okay, let's look at a mass flow rate, just equals rho v a. That's one-dimensional, but in this case, I've got this control surface, and let me just make it a rectangle to be really simpler. Um, dA is going to represent the um, some infinitesimal area of this infinitesimal control, vol control volume, or this is the area of this face here, and it's always going to point in the normal direction outward, right, because we're considering the net outflow. Well, uh, you may recognize that if my velocity is directed straight up versus at an angle, I'm going to get a different amount of fluid coming out. Or if it was perpendicular, then nothing would be coming out. So the portion of the fluid that's actually coming out is the dot product between those two. So what I have here is rho v dotted into 
da, right? And so when I integrate over this whole surface, this is rho va integrate over everything, but I'm only getting the component of my velocity that is uh, parallel to the normal component, right? And that normal component, of course, is varying everywhere along my control volume, okay? So that's the net outflow. And then the last term here is the production, uh, but mass isn't gonna be produced inside my control volume, so that's it. And if we want the integral form, that's the entire equation, we're done. And so we're gonna, but we wanna look at both the integral form and the differential form. Both are useful depending on the context, right? Sometimes we wanna do a, a mass momentum balance around a control volume. Other times we wanna look at instantaneous properties and do a differential form. So let's change this for a differential form. And what we're gonna do is use the divergence theorem. If you recall from the math review, uh, let's see, something like this, that if I have some generic vector I'll just call it W to give it a different symbol. And I integrate over an area, that's equal to integrating over a volume where I take the divergence of uh, that volume and there's a little DV there, right? Integrate over the whole volume. So in this case, my W is this entire term here. So I'm just gonna change this. This term, I could write it also as the integral of the divergence of rho V, Right, and then this term is the same. So I'm now integrating over a volume, integrating over volume, integrating over the same thing. So I can collapse this into one integral. And you may also remember that the order of differentiation and integration is interchangeable. So I can bring this under the integral. So if I do both of those steps together, I have the integral of this first term, I have d rho dt, right, plus, so that's this term here, and I'm going to move the dv all the way to the end here, right, so this is going to be putting those two together over dv, and then I have this term here, plus the divergence of rho v, okay, and this whole thing equals zero. Now, we derive this equation for an arbitrary control volume, meaning it has to apply for every control volume, any control volume that I use, and since it must be zero for any arbitrary control volume. That means that this quantity, this integrand must be zero everywhere. So that gives us the final result for the differential form. It's just that that integral or the integrand rather must be zero at any point. Okay, so that's the differential form. And this here is the integral form. All right, and that's it. Uh, you know, there are some, sometimes some things we have to consider if we have moving control volumes, uh, we have to think about the relative velocity, but for typical cases, this is, this is it. Okay, so before we get to the momentum, let's, uh, let's unpack this a little bit and think about what uh, would occur for an incompressible flow. So let me write the same equation that we just had in differential form. It was uh, d rho dt, plus the divergence, let's see, just to be consistent, I bring a vector, the divergence of rho v equals zero. Now we can expand this term by the product rule. Right? This is just product rule. So I have d rho dt plus um, the gradient of rho dotted into v, that's the first term, plus uh, rho, times the uh, divergence of V. Okay, so that's just expanding that from the product rule, those two terms from expanding this. Okay, now these first two terms together, you may recognize as being the total derivative, right? This is what we saw at the beginning, our substantial or total derivative. This is d rho dt, right? It has both the, um, instantaneous change in density, as well as the convective change in the density, okay? So for an incompressible flow, this is, this is what it means, incompressible. That means that the total derivative of density is zero, okay? So that's certainly true if density is constant, right? If density is constant, this is zero gradient of a constant is zero, uh, 
So this whole thing is zero, although that's it doesn't have to be. That's by far the most common, but it doesn't actually have to be um, constant density to be incompressible. In fact, neither of these terms has to be zero to be incompressible, just that the sum of them has to always be zero. So in other words, I could have density changing at some point in time, and I could have density changing as I move through the fluid, but the density, uh, once I combine them, can't be zero. So when could that occur? Well, uh, multi-species flow is a common example, like if I have fresh and salt water together or some mixtures of like uh, two different gases. Um, so in other words, if I have, let's just say fresh and salt water, the density could change, you know, in time because salt water and the fresh water are moving past each other. And so at a given point in time, my density is changing. It can also change because of the velocity, right? As I move through this fluid, that there's a gradient that exists between them. But if I was to follow a small control volume of say the salt water and move around, uh, it would still be salt water. And so its density wouldn't change. It would still be incompressible. Even though the density wasn't constant everywhere, the whole fluid, the mixture is still incompressible because the total derivative, this total derivative is zero, meaning this uh, small control volume of salt water still says salt water, even though it's mixing around with the other uh, fresh water. Okay, so that's less common though. By far the most common would be um, just constant density. There's another case, barotropic flows, where density is only a function of pressure, and we can show that this will also be zero, but uh, those are uh, less common, especially for aerodynamics, it's, it's generally going to be a constant density flow. So if this is zero, that means this term is gone, and this is what's left, right? Density, uh, or, or in other words, if it's incompressible, criteria that we'll typically use is that, you know, this remaining term, sorry, let me, I haven't been putting the arrows, so I just want to be consistent. The divergence of my velocity field is zero, for an incompressible flow. In fact, we motivated uh, the kind of definition of divergence that way about thinking about incompressible, something that can't change in volume. Uh, that's kind of what the divergence means in this case. All right, so lastly, let's do momentum. Um, it's gonna be pretty much the same as mass. If we go back to there. Uh, we just have to add a velocity term here, right? And we're gonna add a velocity term here. So those two things are gonna be basically the same. Just to go from mass to momentum. So I'm looking at the change rate as I integrate momentum over my entire volume, right? Cause this is gonna be mass times velocity. That's my momentum. I integrate over the whole thing to get my total momentum, my control volume. And I'm looking at how it's changing, the rate of change, my accumulation of momentum. Now I have to look at the uh, net outflow and it's gonna be the same thing, integrate over the boundary to see what momentum is crossing. So I've got my mass flow rate here, but I'm going to multiply by another velocity term so I have momentum, right? So this is a momentum flux now, so the mass flux. Then what remains is the production term. And so unlike mass, I can produce momentum and I produce it through a force. And uh, since gravity usually, as we've talked about, play, doesn't, you know, plays a negligible role in aerodynamics, the only things that can produce forces are going to be pressure and shear stresses. So pressure, uh, we just integrate also around the outer boundary, right? Because pressure is going to act normal to the surface. So I'm just going to use the surface normal here, right? DA. And I need a minus sign because we're looking at um, pressure, positive pressure by convention is going to be inward. Our convention for uh, uh, normal DA is going to be outward, right? So we need a negative sign. And then, whoops, my screen. Then we're going to have the shear, which also we integrate around the edge. But in this case, it's a tensor. I'm just going to signify this with this double arrow for now. It's going to be a little bit cleaner, I think, in index notation. But you know, we'll just do it here as this uh, tensor for now. And, uh, you could think about it a matrix if you want. Many tensors we can represent in a matrix form and sometimes in a vector form too. Uh, but you know, for now, just you could think of it as a matrix. The reason why it's a tensor is because it has two components rather than one. Right, a vector just has one component; it just has you know magnitude and direction. But a tensor has an additional component, which is uh, you could think of it as the face in this in this context. 
means it has another aspect. So in this case, um, if I'm thinking about pressure, all I need to know, or, or sorry, rather a vector, all I need to know is like, well, it's in this direction. But for a uh, tensor, you know, thinking about the shear stresses on this control volume, I've got shear stresses that are, uh, you know, along each face, but I also, and, and also normal ones, right, that are normal to these. So I can't just say the direction, right? Because if I said, well, there's this direction here, well, that direction occurs also here, it's also on this face, it's also on the bottom. So if I want to know which shear stress I'm talking about, I have to say, well, which face am I talking about? And also in which direction? Okay. So uh, to show that maybe in 2D, and you know, if I was just showing one slice, I'd have these shear stresses this way, right? And I can't just talk about the direction, but I also need to talk about the face. Uh, vertical ones, right? There's not just an X and Y now, there's the direction, but also the face. So we have two components to the shear stress. And next time we'll actually talk about the shear stress uh, or the shear, sorry, the stress tensor in a little more detail. Um, but for now, you know, just re recognize that this is representing those viscous terms. So if we want to go to differential form, we do the exact same trick. I'm going to skip it because it's exactly the same. We just take the divergence theorem, apply it to these. We get the volume, we combine them all into one integral. We recognize that that, that integral then equals zero if we move everything over. Since that applies for any arbitrary control volume, it applies everywhere. And then we get this quantity then left as our differential form. I'm going to write this in index notation plus the derivative of rho ui uj dxj equals minus dp dxi plus d tau ij dxj. Okay, and so uh, we note that i is the free index, so this is three equations, and that better appear once everywhere and only once, right? So it has to be a free index, so there's one i, one i, one i. One I. So that just represents um, the fact that this is three equations, right? The X, Y, and Z components. And then I have some sums, right? This repeated J is a sum. So I sum this term three times. I sum this term three times. Um, so that is the momentum equation in differential form. This, I should say, is one form. We can express it many different ways. This is just the most direct if I go from here to here with the steps that I took. But I can take additional steps from there. I'm not going to do it here. You can go in the book and, and look at some of them. For example, uh, a common one we would do is that uh, we can use the product rule here, right? I've got products of things. I can expand these. And if we do that, we'll find that some of the terms we can simplify or cancel using the, the mass balance, the continuity equation. So there are other forms that we can express this in, and some of them are useful. Uh, or I should say they're all useful, um, but different versions of them are, are useful for different purposes. So it helps to have, you know, different, uh, to, to be familiar with these different versions. Sorry, this is pressure. It looks exactly like density, it's pressure. Okay, so uh, to summarize here, um, if we have an incompressible flow, which is what we're gonna start with, later in the semester, we'll get to compressible flows, but for an incompressible flow, um, we only have four unknowns. The three components of velocity, right? UVW and pressure. That's it, right? Density is not an unknown. That's just a constant because we're doing it compressible. And the shear stress, we haven't talked about too much, but at least you will recall the 1D form, right? It's just uh, proportional to a velocity gradient. So it's just a function of those velocities. Um, and some additional parameter, which again, for an incompressible flow, this is going to be just a constant parameter. So that this doesn't add any new variables. So I have four unknowns and I have four equations. The one mass equation, also called continuity equation, and then the three momentum equations. So four equations, four unknowns. When we get to compressible flows, we're going to have an additional variable, or I guess you could consider it two additional variables, but we'll have density and temperature, uh, but those aren't really unique variables because we can relate them through an equation of state, say an ideal gas law. So effectively we have one additional variable. And so we need a, one additional equation, which is gonna be the energy equation, which again, we'll revisit later in the semester.
Uh, finally, I just want to show a little chart here. This is going to have some terms that we're not familiar with, but we'll kind of discuss these over the semester. Uh, I just want to introduce kind of a big picture right now. What we've derived are called the Navier-Stokes equations. They assume a continuum, right? We're assuming um, uh, continuous behavior. We've discussed that if it's if we have very high altitudes or other conditions where the particles are really separated, molecules are separated, we have to maybe use a statistical Boltzmann description. Uh, but this covers a very wide range of fluid mechanics and aerodynamic flows. Um, if we assume incompressibility, this is called the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. If instead, uh, if we keep it compressible, but instead assume, it, assume it's inviscid, this is called the Euler equation. These are, all of these are widely used equations. Um, very soon, we're going to make some assumptions on irrotational. And for it to be irrotational, it has to be inviscid as well. So these will all be inviscid to be irrotational. The opposite is not necessarily true. Being inviscid does not necessarily imply irrotational, uh, but usually does. We'll get, get into that more. So an irrotational flow means it's uh, there's, there's no rotation being induced. Um, viscosity always induces a rotation from that shear stress. Uh, but these are, are useful. It's a useful simplification sometimes. Again, we'll get into this in greater detail. Um, but if we, that's all we assume, we get the full potential equations. These are not used as much directly uh, because they're about as difficult to solve as the Euler equations. But the Euler equations don't require that simplification, so they give us you know, better accuracy and more information. But if we take it a little bit further and we assume small disturbances, we get uh, one equation that applies at, say, uh, near Mach 1. We get others that apply maybe um, you know, at lower subsonic speeds and actually supersonic speeds as well. Uh, these are things that will give us some useful theoretical results we'll see later in the semester. But the one we're going to use in the very near term is the Laplace's equation. In a couple of lectures, we'll derive that, where we add one additional assumption of incompressibility. And in, in that case, this becomes way easier to solve. It's much, much faster than, say, the Euler equations. Um, but it has some limitations, right? We've assumed incompressible and viscid flow. But it's a useful tool in our aerodynamic arsenal because it's so fast. It forms the basis of panel methods and uh, many useful tools because it's a very efficient uh, approach, as, as we'll discuss. So next time, I, I want to get into some little more details about the stress tensor um, for those of you who are interested in that.